Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Marine Money webinar, Conditions and Economics in the Container Ship Market. I'm your host, John Chair, and today we are incredibly fortunate to have Dr. John Kustis and James Frew with us. Both are leaders in their field and both have, a great, have been great friends to Marine Money over the years, of which we thank you. Dr. John Kustis is president and CEO, CEO of the New York Stock Exchange listed Danaos Corporation, which is one of the largest independent owners of modern container ships with a fleet of 62 vessels ranging in size from 2000 TEUs to 13,000 TEUs. Since joining his family business 30 years ago, John has become a very active member of the shipping community as a board member of the Swedish club, the Union of Greek Ship Owners and a member of the DNV Council. In addition to being actively involved in vessel design, engineering and safety, John was also a pioneer in the use of US capital markets for container shipping, completing a $57 million equity, sorry, $57 million equity raise in late 2019. James Frew has more than 10 years of experience analyzing maritime markets and takes over takes overall responsibility for MSI analysis of, analysis of the container shipping and offshore oil and gas markets. In addition, James takes a lead role in larger bespoke consultancy and research progress projects across the shipping sectors. James was responsible for establishing MSI's offshore sector services in 2011 and has subsequently overseen their expansion to cover nearly all offshore, offshore asset types. Since then, James has enhanced MSI's container sector services and regularly advises clients on market strategies and asset portfolios. Before MSI, James worked as a market analyst at Clarkson's Research, where he focused on the container sector. So I must say that we have a power duo for today's session. And speaking of today's session, that format, the format will be this. James will begin with a 10 minute market overview, followed by a focused Q&A session between Dr. Kustis and James. After that, we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. Now, before I hand over the control to James, just a couple of ground rules for those who are new to our webinars. You will all be on mute during this webinar to ensure quality control of the audio. During this webinar, you have a control panel that should pop up on your screen. I will give you an example now. Now, there are two major actions that you'll be wanting to take. The first is to ask a question. This is essential in making this a successful session. The reason we do this live is because we believe it is so important to have a dialogue between the speakers and the audience. To ask a question, simply enter your question in the text box at the bottom of the control panel where it says questions. I will receive them and at the end of the webinar, I will ask them on your behalf. The second major action is the ability to close the menu so you see James's wonderfully insightful presentation. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to James to take us away. Fantastic, uh, thanks, John. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on which continent you're on while you're watching this. Um, I'm delighted to have the chance to, to open this session with uh, Dr. Kustos by initially giving sort of a, a quick overview of how MSI sees the container ship markets and how we see them evolving going forward. Um, I think that the structure of my presentation, it will be quite brief and there'll be a classic uh, market analyst presentation. Very quickly look at what's uh, happened in the market so far, work, walk through the demand side outlook, talk a little bit about the fleet supply and also the cascade of container ships, what the cascade is and what we see as the implications of the cascade before um, then trying to give you a view of how we see uh, market balances and the, the market outlook shaping up. So uh, without anything further, I'll jump straight in uh, to the market overview. And um, look, for, for an industry that ultimately uh, serves the global manufacturing industry, carries a significant proportion of global trade by value. Um, it was pretty inevitable that uh, coronavirus with its twin impacts on free uh, freedom of movement and um, on econ the global economic outlook would hit container shipping pretty badly. Um, the way we're seeing this is that um, uh, sort of three phases of impacts. To begin with, um, you had sort of the closure of Asian factories, particularly acute in February and March. We're, we're now seeing most Asian factories coming back to some level of uh, production. The second order impact is the sort of immediate lockdown that you're now seeing amongst sort of much of, sort of the Western economies. 
And then the third impact is how the wider economic fallout will, um, will ripple through the global economy and how that will impact on consumer spending and demand, both in sort of the developed West, but uh, Western economies. Also, we're looking with considerable apprehension at oil producers, oil, oil producing economies, and how sort of we see North, South and non-mainland East, West trades being impacted. Um, if you look at the chart on this slide, uh, what I've tried to do is plot um, a couple of measures of profitability for the liner sector. Uh, the dark blue line shows the vessel hire rate. That's the amount that a liner company would pay to a tonnage provider such as Teneos in order to be able to hire their vessel. Um, the freight rate instead is what a liner company gets paid by a shipper such as Walmart or Nike to move a container of goods from A to B. Um, I think there's two messages I take from this chart. Um, firstly, of course, coronavirus has had an impact and you are seeing, you have seen downside to both the freight and the charter markets. Um, the other point I'd make though is so far, there's been a degree of resistance to, you know, we aren't seeing the markets fall back to the levels we saw in 2016, um, neither for the freight nor the charter rates. And particularly just looking very narrowly at freight rates without looking at the supply side measures that liner companies have had to take to support freight rates. We're just narrowly looking at freight rates. The freight markets don't look too bad. And particularly when you take into account the fuel price. Um, I don't know if anyone can remember as far back as IMO 2020 uh, and the debates around that. That used to be a big thing, believe it or not. Um, but uh, instead of seeing sort of a, a, a real upside to fuel prices, obviously, we're now seeing a downside. And that sort of downside to fuel prices is also helping to shore up uh, liner company balance sheets, given, what, given the, the position of freight rates. I think in the interest of time, that's all I'll say about the uh, current markets and just jump straight into the demand side. Um, in terms of the container shipping demand, one of the things that differentiates container shipping from the other shipping sectors, it's got a hugely diverse array of goods that are carried in, in containers. And that means that you, know, you really have to think about the different classes of goods and how they'll be impacted. And I think in, to an extent, um, this is a negative and that you have some uh, categories of goods such as apparel and textiles, which are going to be highly impacted by coronavirus. But on the other hand, you also have a base of goods such as agricultural goods, which we don't see as having so much of an impact. And then, you know, in, in, uh, in between, you have uh, goods such as sort of manufacturing, furniture, and furniture is sort of, we see as being particularly affected given um, it's very dependent on the housing markets, which are more or less ground to a halt in much of at least the Western OECD economies. Um, and that's sort of quite a significant product category. So we do see sort of a differentiated um, uh, impact of coronavirus across the different trades, both driven by overall economics and by what we see as the underlying trade commodities in each, uh, for each um, trade lane. Just to give you a very high level flavor of what global trade looks like in terms of the breakdowns, um, this is uh, how we break down trade. So the main lane trades link uh, Asia with North America and Europe. The non-main lane east-west trades uh, bring in the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent, uh, linking that with Asia, Europe, and North America. North-south trades pretty simply link the global north, um, as you might call it, with uh, Africa, Latin America, and Oceania. And then intra-regional trades, um, Outside Asia, the uh, intra Middle East and Indian subcontinent and intra Europe trades, intra Europe trades are the biggest. But really, a third of all intra Asia trade, of all container trade in total, is intra Asia. And I think it's worth not just treating intra Asia as a lump, but given some of the sort of relative strength we're seeing in economic performance and in terms of handling the virus within sort of China, within Northeast Asia. We think it's worth sort of breaking down intra Asia trade at a greater level. And I think that particularly the relatively high proportion of intra Asia trade 
that's associated with China domestic, with Northeast Asia to China, Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia, we think will give a degree of insulation to inter-regional trades. That's what you can see on my next chart here, where you see um, you know, this, this chart shows MSI's overall demand side projections for each of those main trade lane groupings. Um, you can see we believe that intra-regional trades will see the most uh, protection. The main lanes will be the most exposed to the downside this year. We see sort of a double-digit downside, but a really aggressive snapback next year, both as economies normalize and as a result of sort of very supportive policy environments, both in the uh, EU and within the US. Um, we see north south trades and non main lane east west trades as being less impacted in 2020 seeing a slower recovery in 2021 but i also say when we you know we spend a lot of time as i mentioned thinking about downside risks and you know, our, our online uh, modeling system lets you run your own scenarios and that uh, on downside risks and we say really north south non main lane east west trades are real um, a real source of potential downside risk containers. I'll very quickly touch on the supply side. I think there are two key messages I want to get across. What supply side growth there, there has been, as shown in the left-hand chart, has been strongly weighted towards the largest vessel types. That's that sort of magenta 12,000 TU plus. And also that uh, vessel growth, uh, fleet supply that we have seen is slowing. Um, the second point I'd like to make is the right-hand chart. We are seeing scrapping picking up. It's, uh, we believe that it will pick up over the second half of the year and through 2021. We also expect deliveries to slow. Um, we actually see, believe that you know, for the first time, at least since I've been looking at shipping, uh, scrapping capacity is going to be a limiting factor because the scrap, you know, multiple scrap yards are closed. That's posing a real, real challenge to, to vessel demolition. That's why we expect to see scrapping next year exceed uh, growth in 20, uh, scrapping in 2020. Um, but overall, the supply side picture is one of net negative fleet growth for the next three years. That's almost unprecedented from a container ship. I think that's all I'll say at the headline level on supply, the supply balances because I want to also spend a little bit of time talking about the container ship cascade. When we talk about the container ship cascade, what we mean is the process of upsizing within the industry. It's almost as old as container shipping itself, but what we refer to is the process by which you know, new deliveries of larger vessels displace vessels from main lane trades onto non-main lane trades, where they in turn displace uh, vessels off onto the re inter-regional trade. So you see each trade lane upsizing. Um, it's been a huge area of focus for us at MSI, at least for the last 10 years, because we really see how efficiently that cascade works through the system as being a key driver of the relative performance of different assets within the container shipping space. If the cascade is efficient, then you know, uh, investing in uh, large container ships is probably a good bet. Um, if you believe in inefficiencies and that there's going to be a bottleneck in the cascade, then actually you could potentially benefit from some very positive supply demand balances for smaller vessels. <clears throat> Zooming in a little bit, we really believe now the key to the entire container ship cascade is the intra-Asia trade. And, um, how efficiently liner companies are able to put the old Panamaxes and even older post Panamaxes onto longer haul intra-Asian trades. And really, I think that um, that's, in our view, is one of the key things we're going to be watching in the medium term when we look at sort of the, the investability of different asset classes. As the chart on the right shows, just from Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia trade, you've gone from a trade which, you know, even two years ago was strongly dominated by feeders to now seeing older uh, Panamaxes and post Panamaxes now making up an increasing share capacity deployed. So we think you shouldn't just talk about headline fleet supply numbers. You also need to factor in the cascade. Um, mindful of time, I've got two slides left, uh, one on market balances and one on the outlook. Um, in terms of uh, the outlook for the 
vessel earnings. So this is ignoring line of company line of company freight rates. This is just the uh, bottom or the, uh, what will be driving the top line of Dr. Kustis's business. We're looking at one year time charter rates. Given time, I just want to emphasize three points about the, from this chart. Firstly, we see for most vessel classes, the bottom of this current container cycle being next quarter. We see uh, the charter rates bottoming for most classes in Q3 2020. We see them recovering from there. The second point is that that bottom, that market trough, is nowhere near the sort of the, the real all time lows or close to all time lows we saw in sort of 2016. You know, we're seeing a lot more resistance. We believe that the industry is able to look through the coronavirus crisis, um, see you know, potential for future vessel demand. So we're not seeing um, that, that um, historic trough being reached. The third point is a slightly more sobering point that, OK, we do expect to see a recovery in 2021, but still the significant amount of idle capacity that we believe that we'll, you'll see um, in the market um, will cap that recovery. We don't think that we think you'll have to wait to 2022 to recapture sort of the near term 2019 highs. And then just to close on whether we see um, container shipping as being an investable uh, proposition. Well, I think uh, the short answer is it depends on your timeline. On the left, I've used our online modeling tool, MSI Horizon, to uh, build up a portfolio of vessels. I imagine I own four vessels. Um, they're all 10 years old this year. Um, and the, the left-hand chart looks at how the asset values for each of those specific vessels would evolve. So obviously, in the you know you would generally expect depreciation each year to be eroding value, but as we enter the recovery in 2021, we actually see the rising market offsetting depreciation, um, and you can actually see some uh, positive asset value increase despite the vessels getting older. You also see the cash flow, the aggregated cash flow from the portfolio of vessels increasing. And then uh, to close, I've looked, run some sort of hypothetical, hypothetical IRRs. These are just project IRRs. So obviously, once you add in bank financing, you could potentially talk about higher equity IRRs. For investing in um, each of these classes of container ship, buying at the moment. And I think the message is that for most classes of container ship, we don't think this is a quick flip. We do see downside risk next year. But looking beyond 2021 into 2022, 2023, 24, we do see positivity going out. And on that basis, we believe if you hold a medium to long term investment horizon beyond just the next 12 to 18 months, we do see container shipping as a potentially investable prospect. So with that, I'll close my presentation. And um, I think that I've now got a, quite a quick segue onto asking Dr. Kustas um, some interesting questions about the container industry. So uh, Dr. Kustas, thank you very much for joining me on this webinar. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, good evening, James. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, presentation which you gave. Uh, it's not that I necessarily agree with all that, with your forecasts, but uh, that's why you know we have people like MSI, uh, you know, giving views, and uh, people have some kind of diverging views, which makes the whole thing uh, interesting, and there is, and there is no kind of uh, curd mentality. Exactly. It's, it's what makes a market. Um, and I, I would have been stunned if you'd agreed with everything I said. Um, to, to, to move on to some of the, 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 sort of the, the more specific questions I wanted to ask you, Dr. Kustas, um, I guess the, the first one would be around your, your counterparties, the line of companies themselves. How are you seeing them faring through this crisis? Uh, have their cash flows been affected? And I guess, so, as a, in a little bit more detail, you know, historically, you always used to have certain names, such as MERS, OCL, seen as sort of slightly better prospects. Um, maybe they got some sort of slightly better charter market treatment. Do you think that actually, if we're entering a tougher uh, line of company environment, do you think you're going to see that trend exacerbate? 
So I guess two questions there. Firstly, what do you see as overall the outlook for liner companies? How are they faring? And then do you think that you'll start to see differentiation between them? Uh, I mean, in this crisis, uh, we have seen a completely different uh, atmosphere as far as the liners are concerned compared, for example, to what happened in uh, 2016. Uh, I mean, up until that time, uh, first of all, uh, we still had a considerable bigger number of competitors around. Uh, whereas now with consolidation, uh, there is much better control, uh, mainly of capacity, uh, which is really uh, the biggest, historically, the biggest uh, contentious issues in terms of uh, liner companies maintaining uh, box price stability. So what we have seen now is that uh, despite uh, the dramatic drop in volumes, which is probably larger than the ones in 2008-2009, the actual box rates uh, have not only kept up, uh, but have overall firmed considerably. And with exception, for example, for the trades to Latin America, which has its own problems uh, due to the pandemic, which were the last ones. Uh, or in most other trades, uh, we see a steady to rising box rates. So this in combination with uh, record low fuel oil prices uh, makes the overall financial result of the liner companies uh, pretty neutral if not positive. Uh, I mean, from whatever information we have, uh, we don't believe that liner companies uh, will have uh, losses in uh, 2020. Uh, I'm not saying that there's going to be any kind of record profit, but definitely, uh, Everyone is going to be uh, on the positive side uh, because of all these factors. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the uh, charter rates, uh, which for liner companies to a smaller or greater extent are also uh, you know, a significant cost, uh, are on the downturn. And uh, although this is, of course, uh, not to the benefit of charter owners like us, it definitely contributes to the financial stability of our counterparts. So uh, in this kind of crisis, uh, I think that uh, the counterparty risk is pretty low uh, compared to uh, what has been in uh, previous uh, crises for all the reasons I've mentioned before. Okay. And um, you touched uh, on one of the big topics in container shipping, the, the consolidation of the big liner companies and how we've gone from sort of 18, 19 uh, big liner companies when I entered the industry to, to sort of uh, less than 10. Um, do you see MLO consolidation as a benefit or, or, or a threat to a business like yours? Well, as far as charter owners are concerned, uh, in general, consolidation is definitely against us because we have uh, a smaller number of uh, customers. Uh, of course, on the other hand, uh, larger companies are more solid counterparties. And in this respect, the counterparty risk goes down. So. Uh, you know, there are always pros and cons. Uh, it's uh, definitely here we are not like the dry bulk market that you have a multitude of uh, counterparties around, mm. but with counterparties that uh, uh, the majority of them are, let's say, non-bankable, yeah. just small outfits. 
Here we have a smaller number of uh, much better capitalized uh, companies. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And um, I guess my, my, my third question would be sort of just around the, the impact of COVID-19 on Daenerys directly. Have, have you seen much of an impact of that on, on your ships or your shore staff? Well, first of all, uh, as every shipping company, uh, we are struggling with the crewing issues. As you know, crewing is virtually uh, at a standstill. Uh, we are unable to uh, you know, take on or own our ship's uh, crew. And even what is even deplorable, I must admit, is that even for cases of sickness, uh, there is tremendous pushback from uh, you know, the various uh, ports in mm. disembarking. And I'm, talking, I'm not talking about people that have uh, COVID-19 or something like that. I mean, uh, that I would be very understandable. And fortunately, touch wood, we don't have anything on board. But even for cases that uh, toothache was there, and they needed to visit, you know, a dentist. And, you know, they, they just, you know, wouldn't let the crew go out. And uh, it's not, uh, unfortunately, kind of on a single port. This has been, uh, you know, an attitude uh, taken by most ports around. And uh, I must say, uh, really, that uh, all uh, the IMO and the world should really uh, show much more respect to the people who have managed during this pandemic to keep the flow of goods open. Because, you know, Airline traffic is down, everything else is down, lockdowns. The only thing that was functioning was ships and ports. Yeah. I, I couldn't yeah. agree more. I couldn't yeah. agree more. Uh, financially now, uh, of course, uh, you know, in a company like us uh, that has a pretty extensive charter coverage, uh, the effects uh, take time to show uh, definitely vessels that uh, you know are opening around now uh, have well for the time being we are managing to find employment but of course at significantly lower uh, rates than they were chartered before uh, fortunately not at rates uh, below uh, operating costs so it's you know we're not uh, really kind of subsidizing that to a certain extent uh, mm -hmm. but definitely uh, yes it's going to be uh, a minus uh, on the other hand uh, as far as the analysis is concerned uh, at least with the current uh, state of the market uh, we are saving more from uh, the reduction in interest costs from the collapse in interest rates uh, compared, let's say, to the loss that we are having from the reduced uh, charter rates uh, you know, to our pro-COVID budget. Interesting, interesting. Um, so talking then about, about the future a bit more, um, I perhaps rather provocatively said that, you know, to me, the cascade was the, the key determinant in, in, in what, um, what vessels you should think about buying. Obviously, you've done your refinancing, um, you're able to look to the future and you've uh, looked to acquire a number of vessels. How do you sort of see your fleet growth strategy go, going forward? And can you talk a little bit about what's, what's driving that? Well, Danaus has always uh, invested in the larger segment. Uh, we have never been kind of a feeder uh, company. Uh, basically, uh, I believe that 
uh, you know, container shipping is a game of scale. And eventually, to gain that scale, everyone tries to go larger. Uh, now, of course, this process uh, is not exactly straightforward. But the dynamics are always towards the larger ships. Uh, of course, there will be periods of times that, uh, let's say, the mid-sized ships, and I say mid-size, let's say from uh, whatever, from five to ten thousand TU, uh, may be uh, squeezed from. Uh, let's say cascading from larger ships replacing smaller ones and then uh, a lack of upsizing which is actually absorbing these ships uh, when growth is uh, not enough to justify the upsizing uh, so this is really the dynamic and it all depends uh, on how trade uh, is going to develop and it has a lot to do also with alliances because if you have if people are uh, pooling together in order to reduce their costs then they need larger ships mm. yeah i think we certainly would agree with with pretty much all, all of that uh for sure. Um, I guess um, sort of linked to that slightly, you, you talked about how um, container shipping is a game of scale now. And what do you see as the role of an independent tonnage provider, you know, now in the, in the, with the rise of Asian leasing? And, and do you believe that, you know, that game of scale also applies to your business, that there's a minimum size now? to be a, a charter owner in the container shipping industry? Well, uh, yeah, the role of uh, you know, tonnage providers, uh, you know, has, uh, let's say, shifted a bit. And uh, the, first of all, the first reason that uh, our role has shifted is when we have had the change in the IFRS uh, 16 rules, which practically uh, does not give to the liner companies the off balance sheet financing, as it used to be the case. Now, everything, whether you know they uh, charge a long term vessel or they finance practically, they have it on their books. So, that mm. kind of uh, reason. Uh, was eliminated. Uh, on the other hand, as you correctly said, we have uh, the Chinese leasing companies that can provide uh, really finance to the liners. Uh, and uh, I mean, in, actually, these companies can provide finance to ourselves as well. So uh, we're not necessarily kind of uh, competing because for the liner companies, as I said, the, the difference whether they take it from the Chinese or they take it from us, maybe from the Chinese might be a bit cheaper. Uh, but the biggest issue, as I said, is the way that they treat it in their balance sheet. Mm. And uh, of course, uh, uh, even all these uh, financiers, they are looking practically at no residual risk. So the issue here is to which extent uh, the liner companies would like to take residual risk, or if they prefer part of that residual risk to kind to give it to us, together with the flexibility of a relatively 
shorter term charter because if you go to a leasing house they will give you 12 15 year uh, leases mm. uh, whereas i mean for companies like uh, us we could live depending on the project with shorter leases five seven years uh, because we manage our residual risk in a different way so uh, and on the other hand uh, and also liner companies uh, they would like at some stage maybe to uh, dispose some of their vessels mm. and uh, our role is really to be able to take them and operate them efficiently and charter them elsewhere so there will always be a role for companies like us it's just that uh, you know we need to see the new environment and adapt to it yeah. james maybe just no. to quickly interrupt um maybe just one more question for Dr. Kustis, and then we're going to open up the floor to the audience. Um, we have quite a few questions that have come in. Um, to the audience, I'm sorry that we've gone over time, but we're going to extend this time to uh, another 10 more minutes for a Q&A. So just, you know, stick with us and we'll, we'll get to the questions. Thank you. Uh, so I guess the, the final question that I, I'd ask you, Dr. Kustis, is, um, yeah, I touched briefly on how IMO 2020 seemed to be such a big thing until it wasn't. But what's your, your strategy been around fitting scrubbers uh, at Daenerys? And what's your strategy longer term around reducing emissions? As far as scrubbers are concerned, uh, I mean, in our case, and from any container company, uh, as you know, fuel is a pass-through. So mm. all the deals that we have done on scrubbers are related to the uh, payback full payback of the scrubber during the charter period with a kind of a small profit on our investment but basically the profit that we have is that we have a scrubber installed vessel at the end of the charter uh, so we do not really take uh, any uh, risk in all that uh, we have almost completed uh, our 11 ship uh, scrubber investment and mm -hmm. uh, you know we're uh, practically uh, uh, looking forward to see what will happen in that kind of market at the end of their charters which for uh, most ships doesn't come until 2023 2024 Fantastic. Um, all right, so let me kind of take over with some of these questions. And the first one is for you, Dr. Kustis. How are you finding the capital markets? Is there any kind of capital you want but can't find or access? Well, capital markets, uh, you know, have not been really, uh, you know, shipping's best friends. Uh, we have seen the current, the collapse of the current uh, the share prices of all shipping companies at prices which are way below uh, net asset value. Uh, so one thing is that that's for sure is that uh, it's not the right time uh, to access the capital uh, markets because it's going to be uh, highly diluted. Uh, I hope that uh, when things normalize, we will be able to, uh, let's say, to show to investors that there is value in uh, shipping. And uh, you know, to be able to make money for everyone. Great, and I guess a follow-on question to that is, you know, how are you finding your deals right now? Sorry to find what? How are you finding deals right now, your deals? 
Ah, uh, well, there are always ships on the market. Uh, we are discussing with uh, all uh, with uh, the liner companies about vessels which they may have. There are lots of ships that uh, you know from Japan that are ending long-term charters and they are disposing. You know this. There is considerable supply. All right, that's fantastic. And I guess a quick question for you, James. How do you assess the speed as a factor in the market at the moment? And how long will liners continue to blank such a massive amount of sail sailings? Sure. Well, I guess um, it's it's really interesting that yeah, I saw Zim have started up another sort of fast service um, across the Trans Pacific. And you know, liner companies always try and do this. Um, the shippers always urge them to, and then the liner companies try and ask the shippers to pay for it, and they never do. Um, and yeah, we we've seen this before with TCC. Um, I I think it's it's interesting that you are starting to get a bifurcation of speed. You've got some services going around the Cape for Good Hope, so you know, uh, considerably longer transit times to um, to Europe. Um, we we model it. Um, we believe that basically, you, you, you know, obviously speed is one of the key drivers of sort of available fleet supply. Um, we believe that we don't expect to see much more uh, slowing down of the fleet than we've seen before. We think that you know, as the market recovers, you'll start seeing uh, carriers rerouting via the Suez Canal. Um, but we don't regard that as a normal a normal practice. Um, in terms of the, the uh, number of blank sailings, I mean, to be honest, it depends on demand. Um, our view is that, you know, through Q3, you'll start to see a stabilization. You'll see fewer blank sailings. Um, and by Q4, you'll, you know, the blank sailings that you see will look more like the seasonal blank sailings that you sort of expect towards the end of the year in, in Q1. But it's not, um, but, uh, there's obviously a huge question mark around that based on what your demand side assumptions are. Okay. Uh, this question, I believe, is for Dr. Kousis, but uh, James, feel free to jump in. Has the withdrawal of numerous shipping banks influenced CapEx or, in a large scale, the relationship between equity and debt? Uh, yeah, there's no doubt that uh, if you don't uh, find uh, bank finance, then it's, you know, you require much more equity. Uh, and this is definitely, uh, you know, a positive thing because uh, if you don't have really finance, uh, then you do not go and order ships in the end. So overall, this lack of uh, finance uh, is also uh, responsible to the restraint in new buildings, which is really, uh, it's the new buildings that are going to destroy the market uh, in the long run. Okay. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in around regionalize, regionalization versus globalization. So, you know, what do you think the effects of COVID-19 will have on world trade in the medium and long term with regards to those two, two factors? Should, shall I take this one first, Dr. Kustis, and then you can you can jump in. Yeah, okay. um, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think, you know, it's something we've already seen, you know, with the US-China trade war, um, where we've seen sort of the, some supply chains moving maybe back across the Pacific, but what we saw a far greater amount of is uh, supply shifting from uh, China to, to Southeast Asia. Um, uh, my my feeling is that sure, you know, containerization historically was driven by the outsourcing of production of manufacturing from Europe and North America to Asia. Um, that obviously isn't happening very much anymore. Um, only maybe for a couple of uh, small commodity sectors. We don't believe in huge, widespread relocation of manufacturing back. And that's just because now in, in China, you've built up, or, or in Asia as a whole, you've built up such an efficient 
production-based, especially efficient uh, supply chain, and you've got real economies of scale of manufacturing there. But we don't really believe that you're going to be able to sort of turn the clock back and, and bring back sort of European manufacture of um, plastic toys. We don't we don't see that happening so much. Dr. Kusis? Yeah, uh, I don't have much to add. Yes, I agree with James. Uh, I don't believe that, uh, you know, a kind of repatriation of uh, manufacturing uh, is something feasible because the actual, uh, we have the, the cost structures in all the consumer countries have not changed. Uh, and on the other hand, transportation costs have gone down, uh, which means that uh, it doesn't really uh, make sense to introduce, uh, to relocate something at home if you're going to pay more for that. In the end, it's the consumer who's going to decide. Hmm. Very true. We have maybe two more final questions, if that's okay with you guys. Yes. Yeah. So what will be the impact of government support on liner companies? Um, shall I go first again? Yeah, go ahead. Um, look, historically investing in liner companies, not in the container ships themselves, but investing in liner companies hasn't been a great idea. Um, and that's been basically because of the level of government support. Um, obviously, you know, what you hope is that the government support that potentially is going to um, come in this time around will be used by liner companies, the liner companies concerned, to reposition their businesses in areas where they are going to be competitive um, and not just used to, you know, prop up failing businesses. You know, maybe you need to look at becoming an inter-Asian liner operator rather than being an Asian-African liner operator, for example, or maybe you, 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 you need to sort of reorientate your business to focus on the trade lanes you're stronger on. That, that's my hopeful side. My, my concern is whether that Oh, I think we may have lost James. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Kustis, would you like to tick up? Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, governments really uh, see uh, liner shipping as a very important, uh, let's say, national uh, treasure. And uh, when in 2016, the Koreans for kind of for political reasons decided to pull the plug on Hanjin. Uh, they have uh, uh, greatly regretted that decision. And uh, I'm pretty sure that they will not do it again. And not any government will let any major liner companies go down. Uh, it's a uh, it's important for uh, world trade, it's important for the countries to ensure that uh, you know, trading proceeds uninterruptedly. And uh, especially in circumstances like that, that uh, there is no kind of uh, moral hazard that, you know, that companies mismanage something, but it's purely you know, any, an uncontrollable event, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, countries will not have second thoughts into assisting uh, their liner companies. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And the, the final question is one that, you know, was a hot topic before COVID-19 um, and something that you really touched on a little bit. But what about green shipping in the liner trade? Is it now secondary importance to survival and, and, and short-term economic considerations? Well, first of all, uh, you know, green shipping uh, has always a cost. And uh, when you're discussing about a certain investment, 
uh, it's always in relation to your current fuel costs. And with fuel being at less than half the price prior to COVID-19, uh, definitely you need significantly much more, uh, let's say, investment to be able to uh, come to par with the current fuel oil environment. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, all of this green initiative is, uh, is not going to stop. Uh, I believe, yes, it's going to be kind of slightly delayed uh, as long as people have to deal uh, with, uh, you know, the current uh, problems and the current issues in the market. Uh, but in the long run, I think uh, we are exactly in, in the same position and we will need to find solutions, uh, which of course, to a great extent, are, uh, will need to be technological solutions, which have to be derived from the both engine manufacturers and shipbuilders. The owners themselves, one thing which they can do definitely is to set up uh, operational uh, strategies that are minimizing, uh, let's say, fuel consumption and uh, carbon uh, impact. Uh, however, this cannot solve the issue. It can only maybe assist us in uh, achieving the 2030 intermediate goal of a 40% uh, carbon intensity reduction, but there's no way that we can assist to the decarbonization of shipping in uh, 2050 and beyond, uh, with, which is, uh, let's say, our collective uh, dream. Fantastic. Great, great, great answer. So that's all about we all we have time for. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Kustis and uh, James Fru, if you're somewhere out there, for a great presentation. And yeah. and yeah. Oh, James, you're there. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, for everyone, this audience will be posted on our site later today, uh, so keep an eye out for that. And um, thank you for tuning in and engaging with the speakers with your questions. We will see you all the next uh, at the next Marine Money webinar. And also, we hope to see you at the Marine Money Week virtual celebration that will go on from June 15th through June 19th. But for now, this is John Chair from Marine Money signing out and wishing you all good fortune. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan and James. Thank you. 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 Th